Hello everybody, this is Mark Rivera of Genre Online Net on YouTube, and this is my feature length audio commentary for the 1968 public domain classic, Night of the Living Dead. I felt kind of guilty when I decided to do this because I'm such a big fan of George Romero, and I feel really bad that this film went into the public domain, and yet I love it so much. And I have such a great respect for Mr. Romero, having gotten to interview him once, that I decided to go with it anyway. But if you notice, the version that I'm showing you is one that it's not for sale or anything like that, but is actually uh, a digitally rotoscoped with stark black and white patterns of the original film to give it a kind of graphic novel type of look. I'm not the only person that has tried animating and doing whatnot to Night of the Living Dead. It's an extremely popular film, and it really defined what we now consider the modern zombie genre or the zombie apocalypse genre that you now see uh, heavily played in cinemas around the world, as well as television most uh Probably The Walking Dead is the most influential of all the series to have come from this. Now, um, Night of the Living Dead is an interesting movie because it also evoked a lot of the pessimism and conflict of the times when it was made and released in 1968. Uh, you had a African-American actor by the name of Dwayne Jones portraying the lead. And you had him at some points in a type of, for lack of a better word, temper, uh, not temper tantrum, but just losing his cool. And due to the nerves of the extreme situation, he actually smacks Judith O'Day, who basically is the sister of a guy named Johnny, who we'll see gets killed by the lead zombie played by Bill Heinzman. Uh, the film also shows different characters, and ultimately, the zombies, which are portrayed here as shambling uh, bodies, but not nearly as decomposed as what you might expect in, say, later seasons of The Walking Dead or even later movies in George Romero's Dead series. Uh, in this particular film, it's the very beginning of the zombie pandemic, for lack of a better expression. And uh, this film, although Romero dropped it from the explanation, uh, this film postulates the reason for the zombie apocalypse going on is that a probe sent to Venus returning to Earth had a, some strange form of radiation that was detected upon it by NASA. And so NASA self-destructed the satellite just as it was re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And it was that radiation that was being carried on the satellite that showered down upon the Earth and is responsible for the uh, zombie pandemic that we see beginning in this film. After this movie came out and subsequent sequels were made, wisely George Romero changed the origins of the zombies to basically liking it to, for example, No More Room in Hell, as seen in the original Dawn of the Dead, and uh, basically in Day of the Dead, we're being punished by the creator, and in Land of the Dead, one character played by John Leguizamo says, God left the phone off the hook, and so on. Uh, all in all, Night of the Living Dead from George Romero has three sequels and two sideways editions that take place between the events of these certain films. And I'll get to that in a moment, you know, when, when the time comes right. But one of the things I noticed in the uh, Night of the Living Dead series that you don't necessarily see in other films of the genre is that in Night of the Living Dead, as well as the other vi vi dead films, there's always what I call the hero zombie. And what I mean by that 
is that there's just this one zombie that becomes kind of the face of the film. Whether it's good or bad is not really something that you can communicate to here because, you know, they're reflections of us and yet there's something completely different. The zombies are the great unifiers of civilization, so to speak. They tear down the old and usher in a new age. Unfortunately, in this particular case, me non-metaphorically speaking, they bring about the end of the world. So whether it is the sins of human beings or the sins manifested through science and uh, radiation from Venus, uh, the bottom line is, is that very often uh, the reason why the zombies usually win is not because they're smarter than the humans so much as the fact that the human characters have an inability to work together. And ultimately that's what leads to the zombie apocalypse and why so many lives are lost. Simply put, people begin to take their own directions and some people begin to work against each other. And before you know it, that's what lets the zombies in. So here we're going to have the appearance soon of the very first uh, zombie from the original Night of the Living Dead. And he's like the face of the film, like in terms of when you think of Night of the, the original Night of the Living Dead, he's one of the iconic uh, ghouls that you see. And he's about to appear now. That's played by Bill Heinzman. And he has, Bill Heinzman had very distinct uh, facial expressions about him. Uh, he's a type of face that you don't forget. So there he is. And uh, basically, this is our first encounter with one of the undead. Subsequent films had an unnamed zombie that, that gets killed in the gas station in Dawn of the Dead. It's really a gas station slash heliport type of thing. Uh, and uh, that zombie became the poster for Dawn of the Dead. Then in Day of the Dead, the character of Bub is kind of the hero zombie, as I call it, the face of the um, zombies in the movie. Uh, the, you know, the one that's most iconically uh, associated with that film. And then you have Land of the Dead, which has the character of Big Daddy being the iconic zombie who in that film is really the protagonist uh, in that in that particular story in many ways. He's kind of like another character's doppelganger. But I won't go too much into that because we're talking about Night of the Living Dead here. But it is kind of hard sometimes to talk about these films without talking about the other films. So there will be some discussion of those films in this commentary as well. Now, uh, for uh, the Sideways prequel Diary of the Dead, we have uh, basically, I guess you could say that the zombie, you could, you could choose a zombie to be the face because in that particular film, there's several different types. Uh, the one that I think of is the mummy zombie towards the end, as well as uh, the police zombie. And uh, there's also uh, other, other undead characters that seem recognizable, um, but they're not nearly as definable as say Bill Heinzman and the other people who have portrayed, you know, what I call the hero zombies in these films. Um, it's kind of like wrestling. They become a face, something that you recognize and associate with. That's why I call them hero zombies, because you associate the, the particular film with their uh, unusual characteristic face. Uh, finally, Survival of the Dead. Uh, I think the the hero zombie is actually one of two twin girls, uh, adult women, and... Uh, I think of her as she's first off on the poster, but uh, the, her significance in that particular story, which I won't be going into other than this, 
is part of the reason why um, in those in the you know part of the reason why I consider her to be the face of that particular story. Now there has been some debate as to how these films should be seen if you wanted to view them, and uh, there are several different ways that you can view them. Up until the after the release of Land of the Dead, the proper chronological order for these films would be 1968's Night of the Living Dead. And then Dawn of the Dead takes place three weeks after the events of Night of the Living Dead. And that's something that I got from George Romero directly when I interviewed him about the film Land of the Dead. And uh, I'm going to link to uh, in the description a... Uh, a link that you can follow and uh, on YouTube here because it was only an audio interview at the time. I don't even think YouTube existed yet um, of me talking to Mr. Romero back in 2004 about uh, day, dawn, the, the series as it was back then. So, um, you know, you can hear straight from the horse's mouth because uh, basically... Uh, he said that the only film where he ever put a timeline on it was Land of the Dead, where, which takes place three years after the events of this movie. However, uh, I pointed out to him, and he paid me the really great compliment that I know his movies better than he does, uh, which, um, well, it's in the commentary that I'll be linking to in the description, and if you want to listen to it on YouTube, you can. Uh, it's on my channel. In addition to that, I will also have a link to a little featurette that I made where you see George Romero introducing Night of the Living Dead, and then it cuts to the three cameos that he has in the original trilogy. Um, basically, uh, Day of the Dead originally was supposed to take place five years after the events of Night of the Living Dead. However, this was abandoned in part because of the budgetary changes and just the personal choices of George Romero. And so I have to call this out because when the book that presumably concludes this uh, whole Sanguary saga called entitled The Living Dead, written by George A. Romero and Daniel Krauss, who... Uh, I believe won the Academy Award for his screenplay for The Shape of Water, which was directed by Guillermo del Toro. Um, he incorrectly lists it because he looked at one of the early screenplays that La the La Day of the Dead takes place after land, but it does not because of the fact that it was on an early draft screenplay, and George never said to me, nor anyone else that I know, that that day takes place after land. And the reason why is that as much as these movies tell a kind of chronological story, they're also meant to be seen as stories that reflect the decade. So, Night of the Living Dead reflects what was going on in 1968 with the different, you know, revolutions going on in society, whether it be the civil rights of uh, African Americans uh, that, you know, that were occurring in the South, uh, anti-war with regard to Vietnam, and basically the, um, the generation gap that was occurring between uh, one generation and the generation that I guess we look, we now call the baby boomers. Um, the, the film itself, um, as I said before, is the beginning of the story. But at, when I spoke to George, he told me point blank that although there is a time to it, these films are not like telling a story. So each film, even though they are in the same universe, so to speak, and you, he can, you, they, one takes place after another, and you may or may not get a time period from it, 
Uh, these films also stand alone by themselves, which is the reason why um, there was never any attempts in the sequels and so forth to make the characters look like they were back in 1968 or 1970 or whatever. Each film reflects the decade in which they were made. And that was part of the conceit that Mr. Romero said point blank that he wanted each, he would love to have made a film for each decade. And God, if he was still alive today, I would love to have seen what he would come up with because George Romero always had this type of primal quality to the way he tells a story. And um, he's just ahead of all of his imitators. I mean, he's the father of the genre. Uh, he, he wouldn't have The Walking Dead without George Romero. In fact, in The Walking Dead universe, George Romero never existed, so to speak. So that's the reason why people don't know the zombie rules that it uh, actually um, goes by, which are very similar to, though not entirely the same as uh, the rules that are set up in Romero's films. But Romero, who was, uh, from what I've read, invited to direct an episode of uh, The Walking Dead, ultimately declined. And part of the reason was he said it was too close for comfort. Now, I didn't hear this directly, so it's possible that I can be wrong. So consider this an anecdote that could be probably just a rumor, since I didn't hear it with my own ears, and I can't tell you exactly where I read it. But um, these films are really great, and as you can see here, he got a lot of mileage from Dwayne Jones, who is the African-American actor here. Um, Dwayne Jones was an educated and distinguished man, and... Uh, you, you, he basically is probably the best actor. And in fact, that was the reason why he was cast was not because of the color of his skin, but he was the best person for the job. And so this movie was made on weekends and so forth while Romero's uh, production company in Pittsburgh, which made industrial videos and commercials, uh, helped keep the company afloat. And then on the weekends and stuff, they would work on this film. Um, so, uh, sadly, uh, when the film was released, there was a mistake. And it was the result of this mistake in the United States is how Night of the Living Dead fell into the public domain. Because the original distributor failed to replace the copyright notice when changing the film's name. Image 10 displayed a notice on the title frames of the film behind the original title, which was going to be Night of the Flesh Eaters. But the Walter Reed organization removed it when changing the title. At that time, the United States copyright law held the public decimation required for copyright notice to be made to, and to maintain a copyright meant that you had to see at some point in the film that copyright notice. And as a result of that, several years after the film's release, its creators discovered that the original prints distributed in the theaters had no copyright protection. Thus, as a result, Night of the Living Dead was never copywritten and has received hundreds of home video releases on VHS, Betamax, DVD, Blu-ray disc, and other formats. And of the, among the numerous versions that exist of the film, the most popular version uh, is the one that you can download for free from the Internet Archive, which is what I did. It is their highest or second highest most downloaded feature film with over 3.5 million views. Um, now, for a long time, there were prints of Night of the Living Dead that were all scratched up. In fact, my first exposure to Night of the Living Dead was when it aired back in 1986 on Halloween night. And I believe that that print had an earlier version of, of a colorizing film, uh, which has gotten more sophisticated since then. But this was during the time when I think, and not that he had anything to do with it, but there was a time when uh, there was just, I'm not even going to mention the name because uh, I know he had nothing to do with it. So I guess it doesn't mean to be mentioned, but 
there were just a lot of old films being colorized in the in the uh, mid to late 1980s to mixed results and uh, Night Living Dead, which aired on television uh, in 86, the one that I originally saw was colorized. Now, I remember seeing that movie and uh, it took a big impact because I never knew the whole story of Night of the Living Dead. So when we get to the ending and the shock, I was like, holy cow, I did not see that coming. Now, um, since there are spoilers, there, there, I've already warned you guys in the beginning here that there will be spoilers in this review. Dwayne Jones' characters, character, excuse me, dies. And the way he dies is so, like, jaw-dropping and heartbreaking in a sense after all the struggles that he goes through to be the survivor in the film, to get taken out by a redneck member of a posse. And when I say redneck, I, what I really mean is implied. Uh, there's, you know, they look like a bunch of good old boys, as they would say, but uh, there's never any sort of outwardly thing said that these people are racist or something like that. That's not true at all. However, in terms of imagery, when you, you know, look at what's going on, it gives off that impression of redneck meaning that the person is racist and that it was a racially motivated shooting when actually it was just a guy that basically says, look, I see one and sticking his head out the window and he shoots him and then the other person goes, go, good, good. That's another one for the fire. Very sobering. Now, um, as this film went along, uh, the, uh, there were, the people that created it were screenwriters, George Romero and John A. Russo. And they both had, in a sense, an equal share as to where the sequels would come. And so John Russo did his own novelization of Night of the Living Dead. And subsequently, since the film was in the public domain, he eventually started his own bunch of sequels that began with, in terms of feature films, The Return of the Living Dead, which has become a cult film, but does not follow the rules that Romero set up. Whereas Romero followed and built upon what he already had created by directing the original Night of the Living Dead with Dawn of the Dead. Now, um, after the success of Dawn of the Dead, which was a huge hit, um, the uh, next film in the series came out in 1985, and uh, that film, which Tom Savini worked on, and Tom Savini also worked on Dawn of the Dead. In fact, he would have worked on Night of the Living Dead had it not been the fact that he was drafted into the Vietnam War, and so he wasn't there to participate with the helping of the gore effects that he would become known for. Um, Tom Savini, though, also has a small role that he would reprise again in Land of the Dead that I'll get to later. But nevertheless, um, Tom Savini's was the, for lack, you know, something, his gore effects were the litmus stone by which I would say people like Greg Nicotero, who actually um, apprenticed under him during the making of Day of the Dead, as and, you know, he basically, what he learned, he took and applied with his own talents to form uh, KNB, which uh, has done effects for many movies, not just horror films, and, uh, and made him a very wealthy man. And he got to return to the genre several times uh, with not only appearing in George Romero's films, but also, and contributing effects to them, but also of being an executive producer, a director, etc., on the various Walking Dead television series. Uh, from what I understand, Mr. Nicotero met Romero when he was a kid uh, during the filming of Dawn of the Dead. And, uh, you know, when he got a little bit older, he came in with his interest and in, uh, in, in special effects and not only did he get a job working for Tom Savini and Mr. Romero, but he actually appears as one of the soldiers in that movie that's existing in the uh, bunk, the bunker and silo 
somewhere in the Everglades of Florida. Most of these movies take place in and around Philadelphia, although uh, in the one film that's supposed to take place and mimic at least uh, through the external shots, Philadelphia, well, not even Philadelphia, I apologize, Pittsburgh, um, uh, basically, um, that's Land of the Dead. Uh, although they never say Pittsburgh in that film, the idea is a part of that, a part of Pittsburgh has been walled off, etc., and has become one of the last uh, human settlements where, you know, the dead can't get in, which, of course, they always get in. So, you know, there is no such thing as safe, only safer when it comes to these films. Only safer. So, um, basically, uh, this Mr. Nicotero probably has the most appearances in the uh, dead films and the fact that um, he played various, besides doing effects, he played various zombies in uh, Land of the Dead. Uh, he plays a, at least one of the zombies in Diary of the Dead. And I know he worked on the effects uh, helping George out for survival of the dead. Now, again, I disagree completely with Daniel Klaus's um, epilogue in the book where he discusses and says that the films were not presented in chronological order. The films are, if you, the, the films are, were never meant to tell a story in a linear fashion to begin with. They could all be viewed individually. So you'll hear it if you listen to the interview that I'm linking uh, to this video that I did with Mr. Romero. He says point blank, he wasn't trying to tell a story in that way. It was more metaphorical. However, he did establish times. So that's part of the reason why each film reflects the decade that it was filmed in and produced in. And since the script between Night, between Day of the Dead, which originally was supposed to take place five years after uh, the original Night of the Living Dead. The reality is, is that that script was dropped. It's never mentioned. George never mentioned it to me. The only things that he acknowledged was the fact that Dawn takes place three weeks after this. And of course, Land um, is three years after this. And if you look at the way the zombies evolve, etc., it makes more sense to me. So uh, I basically think that Daniel Klaus is or Krauss is wrong. And uh, if he ever wants to have a discussion with that with me, I would love to talk to him about it because I'm a big fan of these films and not argumentative person, but just quite simply, uh, you know, I, I, I've been, for me, there's Star Wars and then there's these George Romero films. You know what I mean? These are among my favorite film series. So, uh, moving right along, if you were to put these films in a chronological order, it would be Night of the Living Dead, which basically is the first night. Then it would be Diary of the Dead, which takes place concurrently with some of the events of Night of the Living Dead, but at the same time, it goes a little bit further. So basically, it goes beyond the first night till the morning of the, of the third day, for lack of a better expression. Then Survival of the Dead takes place sort of concurrently with the events of Dawn, which we've already established, takes place three, three weeks after the events of uh, Night of the Living Dead. And then... Day of the Dead takes place at some indetermined time period after the previous films, but before Land of the Dead, which is the end of the series, that at least the end of the series outside of the book, uh, The Living Dead um, by George Romero and Daniel Klaus, um, I, you know, outside of that film, which... Uh, it's not a bad thing, and, you know, the way it ends, I think, is Romero appropriate. Like, it's what I would expect. Um, I, 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 like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to agree with this timeline. It just, it, it does, on multiple levels, it doesn't make sense. And I know for a fact that he was looking at an old draft script, because I've seen that script. And there is no 
anything in that movie that says it takes place five years after the events of the first film, five years after the dead began to walk. Um, so anyway, um, so basically, according to me anyway, from what I know, the films, the six films that were ultimately made take place within a three year period. Now, a book that I would recommend, in fact, I highly recommend it, is called Gospel of the Living Dead, and it's by Kim Papenroth, and uh, it's basically George Romero's Visions of Hell on Earth. And the reason why um, I really am, uh, uh, I really think this book is worth getting and reading is Mr. Papenroth is actually a, pr a professor of um, uh, he has a he's, a, he's a Notre Dame professor of religious studies at Iona College, and um, he just does a beautiful job tying in together the first four films. When I asked him if he was ever going to do a, um, an updated version to include diary and, and, uh, and, uh, survival of the dead, he basically said no because pretty much everything for him anyway that George had to say that was significant, etc., is um, was done in those four books. And when you look at it from his point of view, uh, I can I I agree with him. Uh, so it's the name of the book is Gospel of the Living Dead: George Romero's Visions of Hell on Earth. It's by Kim Papenroth, spelled P A F F. E N R O T H. It is published by Baylor University, BaylorPress.com, and you can buy it at Amazon. Uh, I'm going to see what the price of it is for you guys. Uh, it should be on somewhere here. Uh, well, that's how it's weird. They don't have a price, so unfortunately, you need to scan the uh, code. But the ISBN number is 978-1-932792-65-2. So uh, I know I went through that very fast, but you can always pause it and return to it to get that. Or you can just do a search on Amazon to uh, find Gospel of the Living Dead, uh, George Romero's Visions on Earth by Kim Papenroff. You can also purchase The Living Dead, co-written by George Romero and Daniel Krauss on Amazon as well. And that book came out, I believe, in 2020. It has a suggested retail price of $27.99 in the U.S. and $37.99 in Canada. It's a hardcover book, and that, could, that was published by Tor Hardcover Books. And Tor, if you don't know, is the largest publisher of genre books, particularly science fiction in the country. As a matter of fact, um, for my first novel, in case any of you are not aware of this, I am an author. And uh, my first book was is, is called The Final Arbiter, which is getting a kind of a, a redo as far as I'm updating it uh, to make some things in it that I would, some changes and edits to it that I wasn't able to do originally. But now I'm, I can do. But uh, it was my first book. I, it was published in 2011. And when I say published, it was self-published through what Amazon called uh, CreateSpace. And uh, basically, uh, it got some good notice, good reviews. I did a couple of, uh, not a book tour, but a couple of talks on the book. And, um, well, I'm not going to go into that because this is not about my work about George Romero's work, I do want to say that uh, I'm very familiar with Tor books is because I was among my book, The Final Arbiter, uh, was among the top 10 uh, science fiction novels of 2011 as chosen by readers in the Tor.com uh, Science Fiction and Fantasy Readers Awards. Now, that's not a jurid award. It's more of a popularity contest. Nevertheless, I came right behind uh, Ready Player One and ahead of A Dance with Dragons. And while I don't compare myself to either author, I do at least can say that I'm in good company. Anyway, moving right along. Uh, 
so we have here now, you know, uh, the reason why, as I said before, I wanted to give it a, uh, for this particular, my own personal version of the film, uh, since it is in the public domain and practically anyone and everyone has made their own little versions of the film. Obviously this film, will, this version will not be, is not, you know, uh, for sale or anything like that. It's just basically something that I did. So I've done a lot of experiments with uh, films over the years and with public domain films, depending so long as you're familiar with the licensing laws of a public domain film, because you can't do anything you want with every public domain film. Some films have certain rules pressed about it in copyright. I'm not a lawyer. I can't advise you on copyright law. But if you go to the Library of Congress's website and go to Creative Commons and just do some honest research, you'd be surprised what you could learn about copyright intellectual property and the um, how films fall into the public domain and what, when, what keeps them in the public domain and what whether a film is dedicated by its creator or somebody else into the public domain or by the law, it's recognized by the Library of Congress or whatever it might be. Um, uh, uh, it's it's good to know these things, period. Especially if you're if you do what I do. Now, I mean, I've created a library of public domain films, and I could just tell you that not every single film has a license on it that says just because it's in the public domain you can do whatever you want. Uh, Night of the Living Dead is a different story, but there are some films that you can distribute it however you want, even distribute it for money, but you can't change anything about it. So, um, you know. Each one has its own different set of rules. Uh, I suggest you go to Creative Commons if you want to learn about that, because once again, I'm not a lawyer, and for me to give out legal advice of that sort of thing would be akin to uh, somebody giving financial advice to someone, and they're not a broker. You're not supposed to do that. Okay, so um, there have been numerous versions of Night of Night of the Living Dead. This one I told you my main idea was that I wanted to make it look kind of like this stark black and white graphic novel. So that was the reason why I did it. But um, first off, uh, probably my favorite version, the best version uh, up until recently of Night of the Living Dead was Elite Entertainment's originally released on Laserdisc uh, 25th Anniversary Edition of Night of the Living Dead. It was THX certified. It was their first release and it was subsequently released on DVD twice again. Then the Weinstein Company released it on DVD around the time that uh, Diary of the Dead was in theaters. And now with a new 4K remastering, uh, the film is available as a part of the uh, Criterion Collection on 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray Disc and Blu-ray Disc. So, um, other versions of the film that exist is in 1999, Russo uh, released a modified version of Not a Living Dead the, called the 30th Anniversary Edition, which basically has its own separate soundtrack and new scenes that are awful. I'm sorry, my humble opinion is the 30th anniversary edition of Night of the Living Dead is an abomination. It sucks. I mean, they try to bring back actors to play the same characters that they did before, particularly Bill Heinzman. I have nothing against Bill Heinzman. I'm just saying that he's grew older and I don't care how much makeup you put on him, he doesn't look anything like he did in 1968. Nobody would. So, the film just, it, it should be forgotten, you know, uh, uh, from, in fact, uh, Harry Niles of Anacol News promised that he would permanently ban anyone from his publication who offered any positive criticism of the film. Well, I won't go that far, but I, I do think that the film is horrible, so I would avoid that like the plague. A collaborated animated project of Not a Living Dead Reanimated was released, and uh, that also relieved some... Uh, 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 some uh, um, basically uh, in the cat it was nominated in the category best independent production film documentary short in the Eighth Avenue Rondo Hatton Classic Horror Awards, um, and then um, following the uh, well we have the Criterion Collection one now 
But then there is the splintering between the two series, which, as I said before, uh, Romero's films are the original trilogy is Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, and uh, Day of the Dead. And then the second trilogy is Land of the Dead, Diary of the Dead, and Survival of the Dead. And as I've already gone into in this commentary about how you could see them if you choose to see them in that way. Whereas in the Return of the Living Dead series, it has a completely different type of timeline. And basically, um, it doesn't, it's even different from the book, The Return of the Living Dead. Um, but basically, you have the original classic, uh, for different reasons, by Dan O'Bannon, The Return of the Living Dead, and its sequels. Uh, that basically, um, they, they, they've, I think they made about. Uh, five sequ five, what's two three four, maybe four or five sequels in the return of the living dead side but they go completely like there's no continuity whatsoever they're just its own different thing uh george cameron romero son of george of the director george romero wrote a prequel uh, to the classic uh called uh, under the working tower titles origins and rise of the living dead and uh at this point it, you know, uh, I don't know if it's ever materialized, uh, but in April 2021, Heavy Metal Magazine published the first issue of the graphic novel adaptation titled Rise, The Rise from Romero's script with art by Diego Yaper. Other films regarding Not a Living Dead include Tom Savini's 1990 remake of the film starring Patricia Talman as well as um, the gentleman from Candyman, uh, as uh, he, you know, is a great actor into himself. I'm terrible with names, so you'll have to forgive me that I don't remember his name exactly. Um, hey, it's what happens when you get older, you get brain fogs. Uh, there was a 3D version of the film that was um, directed by Jim Broadstreet, uh, which has nothing to do, it's not a straight remake, uh, uh, it was in 2009, there was, uh, Simon Mist, Simon West was producing a 3D animated retelling of Night of the Living Dead, uh, originally titled Night of the Living Dead Origins 3D. It was later retitled Night of the Living Dead Darkest Dawn. And, uh, the movie was written and directed by Zebediah De Soto. And that voice class includes Tony Todd, and that's the name of the gentleman who played Ben in both the 1990 remake, and he's reprises the re role of Ben for this uh, animated 3D remake, as well as Danielle Harris as Barbara, Joseph Pilato, who basically appeared briefly in Dawn of the Dead and played the villain Rhodes in the original uh, Day of the Dead, as uh, Harry Cooper, Alona Tal as Helen Cooper, Bill Mosley as Johnny, who also played Johnny in the 1990 remake, uh, Tom Sizemore of Chef McClellan, as Chief McClellan, and Aaron Braswell as Judy, and Michael Diskant as Tom. Uh, then uh, there was director George Schultz's 2011 film, Mimesis, Not a Living Dead, relates the story of a group of horror film fans who became involved with a real life version of the 1968 film. Due to the public domain status, several other independent producers have done their own remakes, uh, including Night of the Living Dead Resurrection in 2012, On Night of the Living Dead in 2014, Rebirth in 2021, Night of the Animated Dead in 2021, and uh, A Night of the Dead in 2022, Night of the Living Dead 2 in 2021, and Festival of the Dead in 2023. So uh, you can basically see how uh, this film has not only touched and affected the genre that it created, uh, but it also has a ton of remakes. Okay, it's even been made into a play uh, that was performed in Toronto, Leeds, and Auckland. So it has a terrific legacy. So, 
this is one of the I, now I have a theory about this film and I'm not saying that I'm correct on this obviously theories mean a, uh, you know, like kind of like this might maybe it's so maybe it's not but you know in some ways although the elements are, are different etc I think the Night of the Living Dead personally owes a bit of um a bit of a uh, uh, owes a bit of at least a nod to to Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds because they're very similar in terms of how they open although uh, The Birds obviously has a more romantic type of opening but both films quickly devolve into chaos and and the threat of death and both films ultimately end very open-ended uh, The Birds just ends and you could say the same thing you know the characters in Night of the Living Dead are all dead, but there's no sign for the zombie apocalypse having stopped. Indeed, as far as I know, it just keeps going on forever, much like how Robert Kirkman divide, uh, basically described his uh, Walking Dead series as the zombie movie that never ends. So um, this now basically, you know, you're going to be introduced to one of the ways of how, uh, finally, how do you stop a ghoul? Well, here you see it. Boom. Shoot him in the head. Uh, the, the, as I said before, this film, you know, is in the public domain. And uh, uh, when we're talking about actors and actresses that have returned to appear in the six Romero films, uh, Basically, besides Greg Nicotero, who worked on these some of these films and has multiple different character roles, um, Joe Pilato, who played the character of Rhodes, plays uh, uh, basically a cop that's going AWOL in the beginning of Dawn of the Dead after the massacre inside the uh, uh, Philadelphia um, uh, project. In fact, the settings of the films tend to be uh, Night of the Living Dead takes place on the countryside, uh, towns in and around near Pittsburgh, uh, while Diary of the Dead begins at the University of Pittsburgh and ends in the outskirts of Philadelphia. Dawn of the Dead begins in Philadelphia and ultimately ends up in a shopping mall somewhere on the Pennsylvania countryside. Um, uh, Day of the Dead takes place within a silo and bunker in the Everglades of Florida. And uh, Land of the Dead, although it's never said it's supposed to be it, it's basically supposed to be Pittsburgh and basically a feudal system of different uh, cities have become the new government, so to speak. And um, while it's not known whether every, every city still exists, um, the one that's supposed to be a part of Pittsburgh unofficially is uh, one that basically, uh, you know, re uh, basically is the one that we center on. Now, um, so besides appearing, so playing two different characters, uh, we also have a character that is the same character, but we see him when he's alive and then we see him when he's undead. Tom Savini's character of Blades is introduced in Dawn of the Dead with his machete, which he uses on one of the zombies. And then the undead version of that same character is present in the film. And uh, he basically does the same machete thing, but this time it's to one of the living. Uh, what's interesting is the director of uh, Document of the Dead, which is a uh, documentary regarding the re, the original production uh, of uh, Dawn of the of Dawn of the Dead, which you can, um, you know, it's it's available on home video in various formats. Um, Document of the Dead, uh, he, that act that that director got to return, and he covered ultimately all six films. So, I think it's great that you know it seems to me like Romero, uh, for the most part you know, which is a good thing to do, stuck with the people that he knew and trusted. Because, you know, the Pittsburgh film community when he started was very small. And so they were kind of like a family in certain ways. Uh, Richard P. Rubenstein, uh, 
basically produced uh, Day of the Dead and uh, Dawn of the Dead. And uh, he, uh, you had uh, um, John Harrison, who plays a zombie that gets killed with the um, screwdriver through the ear. Uh, he would go on to do to compose the music for uh, Day of the Dead, and he would also direct Tales from the Dark Side, the movie, as well as working, working with Richard P. Rubenstein on directing Frank Herbert's Dune for the Sci-Fi Channel and writing the teleplay for its sequel, Frank Herbert's Children of Dune. So you never know where these characters are. I mean, where these, not characters, I guess you could say the same thing, characters, but you never know where these people are going to turn up. Uh, another aspect that I think is quite interesting regarding the uh, Dead series is also uh, Richard Rubenstein and John Harrison are also executive producers on Denis Villeneuve's Dune Part 1, Dune Part 2. So don't look but don't look down on the genre. A lot of great people got their start from horror films. And I'm not just talking uh, these people who I've mentioned. I'm talking people going all the way back to uh, Claude Rains. And uh, let's face it, Bela Lugosi and uh, Boris Karloff are iconic, as is Vincent Price and a great number of others like Lon Chaney and Lon Chaney Jr., just to name a few. Um, in fact, that those films would be fun to explore were it not for the fact that they're not in the public domain, so I wouldn't be able to present them here on YouTube, but uh, in the way that I'm able to do with Night of the Living Dead. But, um, so basically, respect the genre, because I learned from James Glickenhaus in film school He's uh, famous for making the Exterminator films. Um, basically, he said, if you're going to make an independent film, if you're going to make a movie, uh, horror films are your best bet and comedies are your worst bet. And the reason why is that if you make a, even if you make a horribly bad horror film, there's a market for that. People will watch bad horror movies, but... Nobody wants to see a comedy that's not funny. So for those of you who are looking to invest or produce your own film, stay away from comedy if you're not funny, because that's probably one of the most hardest films to uh, make a profit on because there's no market for unfunny comedies. And that's the reason why you have so many low-budget horror films is you'll at the very least break even. At least that's what I was told. And that's what I believe to be true. Um, in, in addition to uh, okay, uh, some of the people who've worked behind the scenes, etc. Um, then in Land of the Dead, Alan Van Sprang appeared again playing uh, a different character. But he could be the same character if he, uh, unofficially. See, Universal owns the rights to the characters and the um, Land of the Dead brand, for lack of a better expression. And so Alan Van Sprang, who um, has appeared in many things since, he w would go on to play a different character, Nicotine Crockett, the colonel. Uh, uh, basically, he has a small role in Diary of the Dead as being a, among the people that uh, basically hold up a, uh, a, a Winnebago with uh, some college film students taking their stuff. And then he has his own separate adventure taking place on an island off the coast of Delaware, which is the setting uh, for Romero's last zombie film. Um, since then, you know, uh, we still had to this day, you'd be surprised, uh, even on Facebook, uh, uh, some of these actors that have appeared in these films are very approachable. I mean, don't crowd them, but I mean, I've spoken to uh, to uh, Ken Foray. He's on Facebook, and he's a real nice guy. And uh, although I've never spoken to him personally, Terry Alexander, who played the, uh, I guess you could say, a Caribbean accent, uh, in um, he's the one that goes, "We are being punished by the creator." That guy, um, you know, he's on Facebook. And so, uh, you know, 
if you see them, uh, give them a shout out, but always be respectful and mind the fact that their boundaries, uh, cause nobody wants to be crowded, especially, um, people who are quote unquote, uh, public figures, you know, even no matter how small, just think of it this way. If you, um, had some small amount of notoriety and then you kept being bothered or not necessarily even bothered. That's a bad word. I apologize for that. But just, you know, everybody has a right to their privacy. That's what I basically mean. So you should always be respectful. Um, we're coming up to the scene now on the television where uh, you get it gets revealed um, the, about the radiation. Also, they start to learn about the fact that these zombies are not just a bunch of maniacs, but they are indeed undead feeding on the living. Um, and so this was, you know, it's been credited for its clever use of documentary techniques, and it still works today. In fact, again, Romero has always been ahead of the time or just on the time. I mean, he, he did a commentary on consumerism with Dawn of the Dead, capturing that era of the 70s. He did a commentary on the 1980s, with Day of the Dead. And uh, he did a commentary on the 2000s, in particular, the, I think, uh, post-Gulf War, uh, post-Gulf War II, America, um, and uh, if we don't negotiate with terrorists type of uh, thing with, um, with Land of the Dead. And, um, you know, he actually even covers the rise of things like something like YouTube, since in that film, the kids are basically shooting films and uploading to a YouTube like platform showing what's really going on because the news is just too shocked to actually, um, even, even reveal the fact that, uh, you know, that the, that the dead have begun to walk and attack and feast upon the living. Um, and then, uh, you know, survival of the dead, it's also dealing with denial and two rival people. Once again, it's always the paradigm that it's humans that ultimately are the reason why the zombies get in. It's the people who are unable to work together in the farmhouse that are the result of why the zombies ultimately break into that farmhouse and why ultimately all the characters in the original that the living did die. And uh, Dawn of the Dead, uh, the fact of the matter is it's humans that break into the mall. It's a motorcycle gang. And the shootout occurs because one of the people in the story uh, has taken that mall to, that, as, as he thinks it's his personal property. And because he shoots at the motorcycle riders, the motorcycle riders who were just there to loot, um, he starts a war with them, so to speak. And so that's how the zombies get the shopping mall back. And once again, it's the madness and craziness of the of Dr. Logan, who's doing these horrible experiments involving the dead and who's going quite insane. Uh, and Rhodes, who's the opposite, who has basically gone insane in his own way and is threatening military force and all sorts of horrible things even implied rape of one of the female scientists, uh, that basically, you know, they're the cause, uh, in some ways of what happens to them at the, by the end of the film. And then, um, uh, in, uh, Land of the Dead, um, that's really at the end of the thing, at the end of the storyline. And, uh, for that, you do actually have a detente, which Romero said that the only way he ever thought that you could end this story would be to have it end on a detente. And uh, he tried illustrating that and showing the signs of that uh, by the by with the character of Riley in that film, recognizing that the zombies, that they withdraw from the city after they're leveling it as far as eliminating uh, some of the bad wealthy characters in the film, uh, basically, uh, they leave and he, instead of letting the woman shoot missiles at them, which, uh, I know pissed off some people that would, that would think, okay, they do deserve it. And 
Well, I'm not saying that they didn't, but the bottom line is, is that um, he recognizes that they're just looking for a place to go, just like they are. Now, the one thing that Romero said in all of these films that ultimately, um, again, uh, leads to them, uh, you know, they never get there, but in the films, uh, Dawn of the Dead, they're trying to get to Canada, uh, Diary of the Dead, it's the same thing, uh, I would have liked it if he made a film that took place in Canada, because that's always seems to be one of the go-to places, besides an island, any island, and, well, you know, that, uh, you have one island presented in, uh, Day of the Dead, it seems relatively safe if that is indeed an island. And then we see how just because it's an island does not entirely mean that it's safe as seen in Survival of the Dead. So, um, it, like I said, in these types of films, there is no such thing as safe, only safer. So, um, you know, the use of these types of newsmen, etc. would, of course, appear again in Dawn of the Dead, and uh, there's a great newspaper, fake newspaper, that says the dead walk that was given to the extras along with one dollar uh, for their participation showing up to play zombies in, in uh, uh, Day of the Dead, since that was an independently produced film. And, uh, you know, I mean, and, in, in, in Diary of the Dead, which takes place at least partially concurrent to this movie, uh, you have the radio, and you also have the internet, and people posting things on the internet, uh, whether they be um, uncut news footage or just pleas from other countries of people desperately saying, shoot them in the head, and that sort of thing. Um, ultimately, the media always has a big role in these types of films too, at least in the early stages, as they would and have in any stage and this is not a judgment on the media it's just a reality you know we'll ha we have many talking heads in this world including our own and many different opinions but if we could only work together you know we perhaps would have a better chance at things than if we only stayed apart so um Kumbaya, you know what I mean? Uh, that is one of the, uh, you know, real uh, realities of the world. And, uh, you know, too many agendas, too many people not willing to work with one another. And, uh, you know, God help us. Um, but ultimately, that's the reason why the zombies always get in. They always win. It's not because they're necessarily, they have the numbers, and they do start to develop in the, in the Romero universe. They do start to revel, uh, start to uh, have gained memories of their former lives that can make them more dangerous. But ultimately, um, it's the living that allow the zombies usually to get in by the fact that human beings are portrayed as being incapable of working together toward a common good. And... Uh, Oh, as dark as that is, I I can't say that it's not possibly so, considering. So, um, you know, take it for what you will. Uh, you know, these films have stood the test of time. I believe both Night and Dawn are in a part have been found culturally significant to be saved in the Library of Congress, uh, preserved for at least all time as we could perceive it. And um, that says a lot to the brilliance of George Romero, who, you know, sadly, he'll always, not, not necessarily sadly, this was his thing. He created it. So, um, you know, uh, R R Romero, he made a lot of great films, but he'll always be remembered for the Dawn series or the, Night, or the Living Dead series, I should say. Uh, in the same way that George Lucas will always be associated with Star Wars. But you know what? There are worse things in life than to be related 
to a successful film franchise that people adore. And, you know, it perhaps it's no coincidence that both of these heroes of mine, for different reasons, have the first name George. I don't know. I'm just saying. So, um, we're getting now, look, we're just beyond the midpoint of the film, and uh, we're coming towards, you know, the third act. And uh, basically, uh, this is one of those stories where nothing really goes right. Uh, in, uh, Stephen King in writing The Mist, and then after Frank Darabont uh, directed the film version with his own ending, which differs from the book, uh, basically said that, you know, uh, every once in a while we need a good story that's like Night of the Living Dead, where the characters, all the things that the characters do don't work out for them. And ultimately, uh, you know, um, it doesn't have a happy ending. Um, you know, he said it, I guess, in a joking manner. But the point I'm trying to say is that, uh, you know, there is a certain amount of catharsis, I think, in horror films sometimes. Now, for instance, um, I may have mentioned this in a different commentary, but you know, I had a professor in Shakespeare class when I was a graduate student, and he said that if you watch a tragedy, like say you watch The Godfather or, ha or Hamlet or something, you should get as close to the stage as possible because um, to get the full gravitas of a tragedy, you should, you know, the characters need to be larger than life. Whereas a comedy, you should sit further away from the screen in order to appreciate all the jokes and things that are going on around them. Because comedy requires you to look at characters from a broader spectrum, whereas tragedies require you to look at characters from a very specific subjective point of view. And I think with horror films, you could say, depending on the film, uh, I think it's closer to the tragic uh, paradigm with where, which is, I think with horror films, you don't have to sit all the way up front, but I do think that you should sit within a good half to mid range from between you and the screen so that you can appreciate all the gore effects if that's what it has. But you know, the best horror films I find have no blood in them at all because you know, after a while, you know, like these films can degenerate into torture porn or things like that and become too toxic to enjoy. But at the same time, I've found that, you know, and I've, I've said this before and I'll say it again, people are scarier than monsters, in my opinion, because if you count all the horrible things humans have done to each other in however many thousands of years we've been on this earth, Monsters, whether they be real or fake, have not done one quarter of the horrible things that human beings have done. And that's not just in reality, because, eh, you know, supposedly there are no such thing as monsters. Um, but, in re but the fact of the matter is, if you probably were to look at all the terrible things people do to each other in films and television, and then look at all the monster kills, etc., and all the horror monster pictures in all the world, I bet you that the humans have a higher body count than the monsters do inflict upon the humans. But hey, prove me wrong, I would love to know, but that would be a great undertaking. That's just my just opinion, you know? What's interesting too is uh, in the Romero films, uh, this differentiates it from The Walking Dead, you notice that fire does kind of make them back off. Now, granted, they were really developing the um, the films, uh, the idea, but it does appear even in Land of the Dead that the dead do have a certain amount of understanding that fire is bad, uh, burning, that it'll burn them. Whereas in The Walking Dead, they will just walk through fire. And both interpretations are fine. Uh, basic difference between, well, at least originally, the basic difference between Kirksman zombies and the uh, zombies of George Romero is 
Kirksman had said a long time ago, I believe in an interview or something, that his zombies would not begin to show signs of evolution. But on the TV series, they had this something, they have these zombies called variants that appear to have more agency than your standard zombie. And this could be seen in the uh, uh, stinger at the very end of the Walking Dead World Beyond uh, limited series. And it could be seen in uh, The Walking Dead, particularly in the last season. Uh, you actually have an origin what it could be for some of these uh, variant zombies in The Walking Dead, Daryl Dixon, which I believe is coming back later this year as uh, The Walking Dead, Daryl Dixon, the book of Carol. And uh, people have speculated that there could be variants in other films as well. Um, you know, it's a rich tapestry, but make no mistake of this, you know, when the pandemic started in 2020, I think a lot of us looked at television with disbelief because really at this point, nobody in the United States, how many people do you know live through the Spanish flu and are still alive to talk about it? I don't know anybody. Um, so, you know, we were dealing with something that was unprecedented from our uh, standpoint. And, uh, there's always this idea that this is happening outside. It could never happen here. But how many people do you know got COVID even after getting an injection? So that's just something to think about because uh, my point has nothing to do with COVID or anything like that exactly. I'm just using that as a metaphor. But if you had a real zombie apocalypse, the same thing would happen, I believe. I think people would watch it on television, disbelief. They would be in such disbelief that uh, they would do some of the things that do happen in the early G Romero films, like trying to hold the dead in apartments because they couldn't bear to put them down themselves and felt it was inhumane, uh, not seeing the difference between uh, a person that has been reanimated and a person that is alive because they still think of it as their family member and uh, or best friend or what have you. And ultimately, though, the, what... what gets me about zombies is that they lull you into a false sense of uh, a false sense of of being like okay I've, I've got this under control usually when the characters have it under control is when a zombie turns around from behind and uh, basically bites them or something like that uh, it usually that's when characters get hurt uh, the only characters who seem to uh, never get killed are those with highly unusual uh, plot armor, as they say. Uh, you know, to me, plot armor, while I understand the use of it and for the reasons, uh, at the same time, it's kind of like the opposite of red shirts in Star Trek. And what always happens to the red shirts in Star Trek, they get killed. So, um, you know, that's that's just an interesting thing. And now, you know, we're coming to... The, we're now we're in the third act of the film. Uh, their escape attempt has failed. Um, things are getting even more grim. The, the door has been busted open. And, uh, you know, Ben's gonna ha Ben's about to open a can of whip butt on uh, uh, Harry over here. But is Harry a bad guy? Well, he's cowardly. He's... Um, not a nice disposition. He's got his problems. He's selfish, etc. But ultimately, under these circumstances, in his eyes, he's trying to do what he thinks is the right thing, which is save his family. Um, it's just that, you know, and Ben is trying to work, get people to work together. But ultimately, they go about things the wrong way. Ben, he goes out and tells them, I'm boss up here. You can be boss down there. And Harry is basically telling people it's stupid to be up here. Um, we, we should be in the basement. And uh, if you don't go to the basement, um, then I'm going to go down there and lock the door on you. And, uh, you know, that's going to be your problem. And ultimately, uh, the ironic thing is Ben survives the night because he goes in the basement. So 
I'm not saying Harry was right. I'm just saying that if they both cooperated with each other, then perhaps they would have survived. This is the first scene uh, that really shows you the dead feeding on the living. In this case, this is something that they've always done with the Romero films, is the dead don't just eat living flesh. They will eat the flesh of the recently killed, as can be seen in this film and in other films in Romero series. And I also think, obviously, in The Walking Dead and whatnot, you know? Um, granted, you know, this might seem tame by modern standards, but, uh, you know, this, you know, the fact having it in black and white uh, at least makes it less repellent as opposed to if it was in color. But, you know, I mentioned it before about violence in films, and while violence can be titillating, I think the problem with violence is this. Um, it's like cursing in a movie. You ever notice, like, for me as a writer and reviewer of films, etc., I don't, I mean, I used to, I actually did used to do screenwriting, but um, beyond that right now. Um, but nevertheless, in terms of storytelling, I've discovered that, you know, 90% of the time when people curse in films, uh, I find that that's the sign of a lazy writer. And the reason being is a lot of times you'll find writers and they'll just put F this and F that in their movies and whatever. And all it does, it doesn't even titillate. It just kind of, it becomes deafening. You either become turned off to it or you basically don't even acknowledge it. It just becomes like meaningless dialogue. The, the only two writers that I really feel know how to use cursing in their stories to affect are David Mamet and Quentin Tarantino. And the reason why I mentioned them in particular is because they know how to use a curse word so that it defines a character at a specific moment and or helps push the story forward. You'll never find a Mamet film where the F word does not define a specific moment or propel the story in a certain direction. And I think the same is true of Tarantino. So um, if you want to learn how to use curse words correctly, study the plays of David Mamet as well as the films that he's uh, written the screenplay for. And uh, definitely study the films of Quentin Tarantino because uh, their work is very much something that, uh, you know, they, they're masters in their own fields. That's all I could say. And there's a lot that can be learned from them. George was an underrated master. Uh, Tarantino is a master, of, of one of the master directors, of which there are very few. Of course, this is subjective, but, you know, Think about the masters. Who are they? David Lean, Howard Hawks, um, John Ford, Steven Spielberg, uh, Francois Truffaut, Jean-Luc Godard. That's more art house, but uh, Sergio Leone is a bit of a master. Akira Kurosawa. I think if I haven't already mentioned it, Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese. Um, Francis Ford Coppola's 70 films, or films of the 1970s, is definitely when he was at his, the height of his powers, as, as far as I'm concerned. And Quentin Tarantino is also a master filmmaker. Uh, what criteria is subjective, and my criteria, which I won't go into because, again, <clears throat> after a certain amount of time, uh, you really... You know, I, I can only say so much before we go off into a tangent that has nothing to do with this film. But I think a lot of people would agree with me on my choices. And if you don't, that's cool too. That's what makes this world worth living. It's the variety that's the spice of life. It's just so long as you don't hurt yourself and hurt other people. <clears throat> this is another trope of Romero's films, specifically in, uh, particularly in... Uh, Night and Dawn, uh, which is, you know, you see this supposed uh, posse of people that, that are coming and 
uh, or in Dwell of the Dead, it's the scientists, and ultimately uh, they never accomplish what they say they're going to accomplish. Uh, the posse kind of go shoots the wrong people, and you know they're you know as we look at Dawn of the Dead, uh, the people in the country are only doing so much better than the people in the city. Uh, this person, Chili Willy Card or Billy Card Carnell, is the father of Laurie Carnell, who appears as the female protagonist in Day of the Dead, and he reprised his role in the 1990 remake of Night of the Living Dead. So, once again, it's a, in the Romero universe, it's a small family of people coming back again and again, whether they come back to play a uh, living character. I mean, there's, an, there's uh, I think his name is Joshua Close, I might be wrong. He plays two different characters in the Diary of the Dead. He plays a character, one of the characters uh, that's working on the production of a horror film. He's the one that makes it, so to speak, the college student, the student guy that makes it. And then he's one of the people that gets killed in uh, early on in uh, Land of the Dead after getting bit, trying to get uh, cigars inside a cigar and liquor store in uh, Uniontown, which happens to be where the zombies are. And make no mistake, Uniontown is not just a town name chosen uh, by chance. It's because the zombies are united while the humans, once again, usually are incapable of uniting. And that's why, again, the dead usually overcome the living. Uh, once again, um, as we go on with, the, with these movies, etc., um, uh, another actor who, uh, you know, George uh, actually made the joke saying, He's the same character if he's Benjamin Button as one actor who plays uh, the son of Mulligan in uh, Land of the Dead. And then he appears as a guy wearing glasses. I don't remember the name of the character. In Dire of the Dead, he gets electrocuted uh, by uh, one of his friends that's turned a zombie in a bathtub. And then he appears as this uh, kid who uh, introduces the colonel to an iPhone after they're using a uh, a, a laptop to monitor the news. So, um, you know, but that movie came out in 2009 or 2010, depends how you want to look at it, I guess. I don't know. But uh, what I'm trying to say is there are actors that come back in these films either to play different characters or the same character, whether they be the same character in one film that's alive and then the next film is dead, like a... Like a um, Tom Savini, or whether it is uh, uh, another character that is alive in both films, like Alan Van Spring, or just different characters. Uh, they may have a similar demeanor, but nevertheless uh, are very different characters, uh, like Joe Pilato in Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead. So um, now we're coming up to the, you know, uh, the the end, so to speak, of the film. You know, this is when everything goes to hell, the zombies are breaking in, and, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is what happens. It's, it's very scary and uh, very disturbing because it's not about, it's, 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 it's a metaphor, you know, zombies are the uh, levelers. Uh, they're the great equalizers of, uh, of horror. You know, zombies uh, don't care if you're rich or poor. They just literally take down the status quo. And, uh, you know, that's why I call them the great levelers or the great equalizers of society. Uh, they also represent change and uh, change the fear of change. You know, um, and now, I didn't go into this before, but this establishes what happens if you've been bit by a zombie and survive, you come back as a zombie. And as another thing that occurs later on that you learn is that um, anyone, whether they've been bitten or not, regardless how they died, so long as the brain or enough of the brain is operational, 
they will reanimate. And that's also something that's the case of uh, The Walking Dead as well. So on the, until, the rain, until the brain either rots enough where they become immobile or somehow damaged enough where they could no longer function and they are essentially finally dead as opposed to undead, um, they, uh, you know, the zombies basically will either keep coming at you until they're wounded in such a fashion of, uh, in the head or they rot out. That's basically it. And um, in case you're wondering, zombies are capable of using tools like this in simplistic manners. Why this uh, particular girl zombie murders her mother in such a horrible way, I think that's more of a dark metaphor. It feels almost satanic when you see it happening. Um, you know, uh, it, it's quite disturbing. But um, why? Uh, well, I think the one reason why is because it's shock value from George Romero to the audience. But um, we do see zombies using tools in other films. They even use, some of them use rocks, etc. Um, and now, you know, we have the horror of what happens to, here's Johnny, and he's come back to get his sister. And, well, in this version, you know, we don't see what happens to her. But since we know what zombies do, I think it's pretty, uh, it's pretty obvious that, uh, what they're going to do to her, you know? Um, so this is now we're coming to the end of the film and, um, he's, you know, there he is, Bill Heinzman and, uh, Ben is going to go down to the basement and he almost gets attacked and, and, uh, bit by, uh, the daughter of the old, of the man and the, and the and his wife who were hiding in the basement, and uh, basically, it's the ironic part is is the basement ends up being the one safe place for these characters to hide out in, and yet at the same time, the basement uh, is a, is a kind of a death trap. If, if that door were to break open, if enough of them pushed against it, uh, although this is a very secure door, um, the bottom line is, is that if that's the only way in or out, it is, you know, they're both right. I mean, it's a good retreat spot. And, uh, and it's, it's at the same time, it's also um, a defensible spot, whereas the house has a lot, but I think if they had worked together and used that as a fallback position, um, which would incorporate both Harry's and Ben's ideas, then maybe they might have survived. I say might because I think that uh, the daughter reanimating and their bell being in the basement would have led to carnage because uh, Harry and his wife, I mean, you see your daughter get up from the dead and they they don't know what the rules are. I mean, here he is, Tyree reanimating. Uh, you know, they they would they be strong enough to uh, put down their own daughter who's reanimated? Well, the truth of the matter is, would anybody be strong enough? That's another problem with this thing. That's why these films depict a type of hell on earth, and. Uh, Yet there could be catharsis and lessons learned from this, much like people learn from uh, tragedies. And I think that's part of the reason why horror films are still, to this day, popular, is they do author a type of catharsis. But the best horror films make you feel... Uh, not You don't... Gore doesn't scare you. Doesn't scare... Gory, goriness is, will repulse you. It can be very disturbing and toxic, but you don't have to. You, if you want to be toxic, you don't have to have gore to be, to really freak somebody out. Uh, I've seen some some good films that have absolutely little to no violence in them, and that work perfectly in atmosphere. That I find them to be extremely toxic and would not want to see them and would not recommend them. Not because they're bad movies, but simply because they are. 
um, movies that are done perhaps too well. But ultimately, what's scary is not having the tools, it's how you use them. And so, you know, George Romero was inspired in his own words by uh, Richard reading Richard Matheson's I Am Legend as he has said in uh, real life, and even the movie I Am Legend, the first film version of it, which was called The Last Man on Earth, which I've previously done a commentary for here, when you can see it in the library, or you can um, see the film uh, without, my, without my commentary in the public domain film library, and that film has also been somewhat altered um, in a different way uh, from Night of the Living Dead and my presentation of it here. But um, that film has, uh, it's ironic that the vampires, quote unquote vampires, are more like zombies, uh, albeit zombies that can like say stuff like, you know, to call out a person's name or something. But basically they're more like shambling things. In that particular movie, I'm not talking about the book, um, I don't think any movie has ever gotten the vampires right. Um, you know, which is a shame, but, you know, a movie is a movie is, and a book is a book. And even Stephen King said, when somebody once asked him, hey, how do you feel about, you know, people butchering your movies, your books, your stories? And he says, what do you mean? My stories are right here. Fine. Nobody's butchered them. They're right here on the shelf. You know, it's kind of like when an actor tells you and he did a B movie you know, and you say to him, why'd you do that? He goes, hey, man, I'm just collecting a check. I had nothing to do with the making of this film. I just, I did my job as an actor. And the film, the, the, making the film, after I've done my part, that's up to the director and a whole bunch of other people that are above my pay grade. Especially if he's not a uh, starring actor. So, anyway, now we're coming upon the final moments of the film. And uh, I have to tell you that it's been fun talking about Night of the Living Dead because I'm a big fan of it. Uh, sorry if I've been a little bit all over the place. I hope you've enjoyed my commentary. And uh, if you like what you heard, please check out the other um, commentary tracks I have that I've recorded for the films Santa Claus vs. the Devil, The Last Men on Earth, House and Haunted Hill, The Day of the Triffids, Trapped by Television, and... The Phantom Empire. That, along with Night of the Living Dead, all these films can be viewed with commentary tracks by yours truly or without them in the public domain library here at genreonline.net on YouTube. Okay, I'm going to close this a little bit early, but I want to say thank you all for watching this. Uh, I hope that if you enjoy my work that you will consider uh, to you know, liking, commenting, and subscribing to my channel, um, because uh, I'm this is something that's very important to me. I am, I'm really trying to try something new here, uniting uh, different things. Uh, genre films don't have to be one thing or another. I think every film is a genre film, and uh, they're not necessarily relegated to fantasy, horror, and sci-fi. Uh, there are many different genres. And we can explore them together. Yes, my shorts tend to be clips of 20th century comedians. But if you look at a lot of my other work, I have a very eclectic mix here. So I hope you'll check it out. Hope you'll uh, consider subscribing and subscribe to my channel. And uh, I definitely hope you like the video. And I hope you'll comment it on it as well. Once again, this is Mark Rivera of Genre Line Net on YouTube. And thank you again for watching. I hope you're all having a great time, whether it be day, night, or whatnot. And stay safe, and I'll talk to you all soon. Thank you very much.